chapter 13, which we are sticking with our theme in encouragement. And to that end, we have a couple more encouragement cards. One for Tim and one for Adam. Care to collect your cards? Yes? Tim? Adam? So? Adam. And Tim. All right. So, encouraging in encouraging is what we're shooting at in this final chapter. And so, this final chapter is anticlimactic compared to chapter 12. It's almost boring in comparison with the previous chapter. So you're excused if you fall asleep for this one. (gasps) But I think you got a better attention span than that. Uh, I was told last last weekend that uh, your generation has the attention span of a goldfish. But I think uh, you're far better than that. And what about this goofy title for this final study? Encouraging and encouraging, huh? Does that sound circular or what? Uh, But let's see how this uh, encouraging title plays out in this one now. Let's see if that encouraging theme of Guthrie and Harris plays out to the very end. First off, Paul mockingly plays with the Old Testament requirement of having two or three witnesses to testify against someone in court. This was mandatory. Um, And here, in this case, it was to testify against Corinth. According to our commentators, Paul is suggesting that his previous two visits to Corinth were legally valid witnesses against Corinth, condemning Corinth, which is encouraging in a negative sort of way. But it is also a pretty novel twisting of the biblical definition of witness as well. It is a definition that probably wouldn't stand on a biblical witness stand, since the witness source is exactly the same. The same witness is only multiplying accusations in this case. However, this legal reference to witnesses brings a far greater gravity to bear on what nasty judgment is in store if the response from Corinth is wholly improper if the response from Corinth is continued unrighteousness and unrepentance, if there is an improper sense, improper response, either from those corrupt Corinthians or from those alleged super apostles, then we have Paul continuing to defend his vision in verse 3 vision that came directly from Christ, endorsing Paul's gospel and not the super apostle gospel. A gospel of presumed weakness, a gospel of grace that will ultimately reveal God's enormous power. Verse 4, like it or not. And then, in this chapter, we get to some obscure but fundamental test in verses 5 and 6. A testing if God is in you. Hmm. A testing if the Holy Spirit is in you. Hmm. If the love of Christ is in you. Hmm. Something that is pretty much an essential if you are going to live with him in eternity. (laughs) or else it would hardly be heaven, would it? And the test, of course, is faith in him. Faith in Christ. Faith in his literal life, death, and resurrection. That seminal creed of chapter 15 that we discussed earlier. Yes, that creed of the seed that I continue to push. That imperishable seed 
that Paul was pushing so hard in Corinth. That born again seed that Jesus was pushing so hard on Nicodemus. As we will read in John next year. That born again and imperishable seed that Peter was pushing so hard in his first letter as well. A creed which is symbolized in water baptism. And there we have a picture of a seed. Oh, isn't that lovely? Ah, we'll get into that. And this is a creed that makes this literal life of ours entirely meaningful. Otherwise, you may as well be a metaphysical brain floating in space. Mere flotsam and jetsam floating in a meaningless space vacuum, jettisoning your vapid thoughts to no one and nothingless forever. Ah, but that's just being poetic. However, this is a meaningless faith. This is a meaningful faith that Christians have, however. It is a faith that manifests in righteousness. It is not a passive faith that does not do wrong, but rather an active faith that does what is right, according to verse 7. It is a faith that says, do, 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 rather than don't, don't, don't. It is a faith that rejoices in truth, that rejoices in the truth of the seminal creed in that literal resurrection. And then finally, Paul says, finally, he encourages the brothers and sisters to rejoice, to rejoice in order that the God of love may be with you, in verse 11. And that's a pretty good incentive, to rejoice. And then to strive for full restoration of what? Well, of those killjoys that it was necessary to kick out of the church. To kick out for the sake of doctrinal purity, gospel, peace, and for their future encouragement as well. <laughs> However, Guthrie thinks that maybe this is merely about becoming one denomination again. Yeah. As per uh, Corinthians 1 verse 10. But I'm not buying into that notion. No. Divisions can be good after all, as we've seen in chapter 11. Which brings us to the final imperative of this semi-final phrase. An active imperative, according to our NIV. Whereas Guthrie thinks this is merely a passive imperative, which says, <gasps> be encouraged. However, I agree with our NIV here. For various reasons. I believe that this final command is to encourage one another. Uh -huh. So Paul is encouraging us to be encouraging here. Kind of like our title. Now, isn't that encouraging, huh? And then finally, an exhortation to greet one another with a holy kiss in verse 12. The holy encouragement of a radically different culture. One that did not kiss and sue like our culture does. Sure, casual kisses were relatively common in that ancient culture. Casual kisses on the cheeks, but rarely on the lips, which was considerably more intimate. Nearly as intimate as the washing of feet that they did back then. But not nearly as fickle or ticklish. However... It seems that this was a holy kiss that was pretty unique to the Christians of that time. A pretty common greeting within the church already. Something that appears to have evolved into our current Christian side hug. Something somewhat less intimate. Perhaps a fad that, starting in, that started in that leading edge city of Antioch. Perhaps a fad based on that glorious account of Isaiah. Of another bizarre vision. Uh -huh. This was an account of Isaiah's lips being touched by a burning hot coal. And of his sins then 
immediately being forgiven, we read in Isaiah 6, verse 7. A profound forgiveness that only Christians can share in, since only Christians are properly forgiven. A touching of the lips, followed by a great commission by the Lord himself, saying, go to this people. And that passage also tells of a holy seed, according to Isaiah. A seed that only Christians can properly share, since only Christians have been properly touched by Christ. But that's mere speculation on my part. But I like it. And then finally, we get to the final verse of this letter, which is verse 13, according to our commentators. The great benediction. A verse in which we have the most robust expression on the interworking of the Trinity in the New Testament, according to Guthrie. And once again, I have to agree with Guthrie. This expression is simply incredible. First, we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace revealed to us in the flesh. Then we have the love of God, a love that is indisputable even for unbelievers. And then finally, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, a fellowship that binds believers together in some peculiar unity. And in the same way, may you quizzers be bound together in a similar unity. And may you encourage each other. Amen. Now, we are going to thank the coaches. Yay. Encourage the coaches. Could the coaches please come up? Okay. We are going to encourage, encourage the coaches with seed. Uh, with seed. We have seeds. Ah. Seed for you. Seed for Nancy. Oh, this crazy, oh, man, crazy nice. seed thing. Getting a little carried away here, huh? <laughs> and wait, 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 coaches. And now you are to encourage your quizzers with seed as well. Oh. Let me see. Yay. How many have I got here? Yeah. Hand out some seed. Oh. 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 Everybody? Everybody gets a seed. Really? Oh. Wow. Come on up, quizzers. Okay. Where's Where's my team? Oh, go up. Yeah, my team. Come on up here. You want some tomatoes in your garden? <laughs> You got some cucumbers, tomatoes, or basil? Okay, you got some basil. Not good, nice little pot.